So uh, without further ado, uh, it's great to, to welcome Tancredi Caruso and Matthias Rillig to, to join us. Matthias is joining us from the, the Freie Universität Berlin, and uh, they're working together on the re uh, Econet project around reconstructing ecological network, networks uh, to predict systemic crisis. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what they have to say. And I think there's a, a video clip from another colleague as well. So uh, we should get to know all about the project and its potential. Thanks, Tancredi. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share the presentation and start. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, first of all, uh, just great. And uh, my goal today is basically to introduce uh, Reconet, this project. Uh, I will do it very briefly, and then we have Matthias Rillig here today with us, and uh, I will uh, ask him a few questions, and then, uh, yeah, there will be some questions for us, maybe. Um, okay, so Reconet, so this is our project. Um, I hope you can see okay my slides. Um, so uh, I will start from explaining the, the acronym. Reconet stands for Reconstructing Ecological Network to Predict Systemic Crisis. And we'll just focus really on the word reconstruct because it's, it means two different things. It means figuring out what the structure of network, of network is, and, but it also means that once you know what the structure of the network is, and you know, basically the processes that contribute to the structure of the network, then you have tools to really reestablish the network in nature in case the network has been perturbed by perturbation. So it's also an, an instrument potentially for re restoring networks. And uh, we will basically work on this methodology, which is called network statistical mechanics, which is a way of reconstructing networks from partial information. Uh, but this project really is, a, it's not in itself a primary research pro project. It's a, it's a project that um, uh, offers a space, a space uh, to uh, network, so it's a space to, to, for scientists to, to network and interact uh, in, um, around the topic of reconstructing ecological networks, but in general, a different, ki different kinds of network, networks. Uh, so we are, I'm trying to, yeah. So I want to mostly introduce the project team today. Uh, so the, the, the project is based at UCD. Uh, it involves four different schools, basically uh, biological, science, biological and environmental science, agriculture, uh, mathematics, and uh, School of Geography. So it's a diff very different um, group, pe people with very different expertise, with a broad range of expertise. And then we have two international partners, Matthias Rillig, who is here today, and Diego. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, this is open. It's an open team. And one of the ambition is that more people within the Earth Institute and maybe in general in, in UCD will, will, will eventually join us uh, in, our, uh, in our project. And uh, we, we, brought, we bring together different types of expertise. We have people who work on plant microbes, plant pollinators networks, on food web, but also on dynamical system, uh, ecological modeling, and then with Matthias and Diego, we have lots of expertise in climate change, plant and soil, fungi, large data sets, network theory, statistical physics, and large and social financial networks, because our interest is very broad. It's not just ecological systems, but also social networks, financial networks, and so on. And uh, we have uh, different plan, plan activities. Uh, we're gonna have a number of workshops. We, 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 we wish to write uh, some papers, especially synthesis paper, uh, literature reviews, uh, method papers. And uh, we wish to, uh, in the long term, write applications for primary research. Um, so grant application for primary research, for example, cost action, or even things like ITN networks to support early career researchers. 
And in fact, we will also have some net for some workshop events dedicated to early career researchers who may want to apply, for example, for a Marie Curie action. Um, and uh, another thing that uh, we will be um, looking at is to launch a, a website and possibly also a YouTube channel to, to discuss and work and present materials and activities around the topic of ecological network and now we'll reconstruct them. Uh, to dig a bit more into the science of it, I, I will now stop uh, this presentation and, um, and I wish to really welcome here Matthias, who, who, who is joining us from Free University Berlin. Uh, Matthias and I, and I have been working for a long time together. Before moving to the island of Ireland, I actually was based in Matthias' lab. So it's a big pleasure for me to, to have him here today and having him in the project. And uh, I think very simply, the first thing I, I will do is to just ask Matthias to introduce himself to the audience. And then uh, I'll ask him a couple of questions. And so Matthias, yeah, can you just briefly introduce yourself? Hello there. First of all, yes, I am that person on this picture that you just saw. <laughs> I think it dates from the time when you were in my lab. Since then, I have grown a beard during Corona times because That's I stopped right. shaving. So I look a little bit different. And um, yeah, I am a um, professor here at Freie Universität uh, since 2007 for ecology, plant ecology more precisely in our lab works on plant soil microbe interactions. And we're particularly interested in um, effects of various factors of global change um, and sustainable management of agricultural systems and everything that relates to mycorrhizae and other fungi and also other organisms really um, in the soil and the plant soil system. And uh, the interest in mycorrhizae is, of course, what connects me most strongly to um, Tancredi's project. And when Tancredi was in our lab, and this is my opportunity to publicly declare my love, is when he infused that group with a hefty dose of theory and the positive effects of that still reverberate to this day. So thanks for that, Tancredi. I'm oh, thank you. delighted to be on board here. <laughs> Okay, Matthias, so uh, thanks. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask you uh, is that if I'm not wrong, one of, your, one of the reasons why you're particularly interested in networks is the so-called common mycorrhizal network, these networks of fungi linking different plants. And uh, many, but possibly some of the people here, they, they just don't work on terrestrial systems or, or in ecology. So very simply, I'm gonna ask you if you can very briefly introduce what the what, what is the common mycorrhizal network and why it's important in, in ecosystems and uh, why network theory could be important to better understand the role of the common mycorrhizal network in terrestrial ecosystems. Yeah, so I think in my instructions you said, please come up with a poetic description of the That's wonderful right. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> phenomenon. And so I've been searching in the depths of my soul to come up with something poetic and I'm sure it's it's going to be a little bit of a disappointment, but just imagine the same thing would be happening above ground as it happens below ground. I think you would be truly astonished. You would imagine a bunch of plants, like say a grassland, and you would see all these plants are connected by silvery strings that connect all these various plants with each other. You would be astonished. And this is exactly what's happening below ground. The only reason is not you is that you the only reason you're not obviously astonished by it is that you can't see it. But there is a hidden network in the soil that connects the roots of all these plants that co-occur in the same grasslands or forests. And it is truly it runs a bit counter to what we've been told or what it says in textbooks about plant communities where the dominant force to structure such communities is competition and negative interactions. When in fact, these plants are hidden from our eyes, basically they are all linked below ground and they're just not patched up to this network. This network is also functional. functional. So there is an um, exchange of definitely nutrients, um, N and P, among these different plant species, and also of carbon, at least the carbon that is inside of the fungus. So one plant can basically give a fungus carbon, that fungus grows someplace else, and then links up 
with another plant and that fungal structure in that other plant of a different species has basically been completely subsidized by this plant A over there. And I mean, it's quite a fascinating vision of um, a plant community when you think about it that um, hidden from us, they're all connected below ground and it, um, it, it you know, puts a much more positive light on things that they interact with each other. And a number of years ago, this has gone through the popular press where um, speaking to the functional significance, for example, seedlings can be supported by um, the parental plants, um, even in terms of carbon. So basically they feed their young, so to speak, via these networks, truly fascinating. Some, something that we've done is we've shown that these networks also can carry information from plant A to plant B. In our case, it was basically toxic compounds that could only really be explained to get from plant A to plant B when you consider that they are actually directly linked by these filaments of the fungi that form these networks. So yeah, that was my, was my poetry. <laughs> no, I, that's great. And uh, what I'm going to, to, to ask you finally is um, another kind of networks we, we are going to de deal with. It's analogous to the plant pollinator network. Everyone knows about the plant pollinator networks, but there is an analogous plant microbial symbionts network below the ground. And my question there is, what are for you the two big questions there in terms of the science of this network? Because, because the difference is we don't see very well. It's difficult to see. It's easy to see pollinators, it's not easy to see microbial symbionts. What, what are the two big, one or two big questions there in terms of how this is important also for ecosystem functioning? Right. I think one is a more uh, question more of, a, of, of the principle of the networks. And uh, you and Diego and I wrote a paper um, a little while ago <laughs> uh, where we discuss if the assumptions that network theory actually makes hold up for the data that we can collect for our microbial networks. And um, this is very much not a trivial matter. So I think this is still um, unresolved, that is an exciting area of research. I mean, with the bees and the flowers, you can observe the visits and you have established those links, uh, whereas those links are mostly inferred from molecular ecology data and we don't actually know for a fact if these things really are linked. Unless we do a separate experiment, we demonstrate this linkage physically. So this is, is a, is, um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a basic problem with ascribing network properties to such interactions. And I think the other major question uh, would be interesting for me anyways, is how do network properties uh, make such networks more resistant to various uh, factors of global change, maybe also interacting factors of global change. So I think those would be my, my two main questions of interest. Okay. But yes, thanks a lot. Uh, it's going to be great to have you in the project. And uh, thank you also for joining us today. Sure, thanks. And the uh, second person I, I wish to have here was Diego Garlaschelli, the other international collaborator. But uh, we, he couldn't be here. So what I've done, I have interviewed him. And uh, I have a little video clip that I'm now going to share so that you can see him. And uh, yeah, you can, you can know what will be Diego's contribution uh, to, to the project. So I'm just now going to do the trick here to put uh, to share basically the video clip okay so let me just let me just share again my screen here we go okay, okay diego thank you very much for being here with us um so uh um, thanks thank you. yes you're very welcome uh thank you for doing this recording for the Earth Institute Coffee Morning. And uh, before we start, can you just briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, sure. Uh, my name is Diego Garlaschelli. I'm an associate professor at the IM2 School for Advanced Studies in Lucca, where I direct the Networks uh, Research Unit, and at the Lawrence Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, in Leiden, the Netherlands. So I'm a uh, Theoretical physicist by training, but also uh, involved in several uh, interdisciplinary applications of statistical physics to biological and social systems. Great. And um, so, Diego, in our project, we are um, looking at uh, methods to reconstruct 
networks, especially ecological networks, but potentially any kind of networks. And with an overall long-term goal of trying to understand, how to try to predict crisis, crisis in networks. Uh, can you give us an example of an application of this? Yes, well, um, as I said, our research focuses on, on networks and uh, we, we are interested from, from the more abstract uh, mathematical modeling uh, of networks to the more applied uh, challenges. And one of the challenges that we've been studying uh, quite uh, hard and uh, heavily uh, during the last years is the, uh, the problem of financial stability. So the, how the structure of financial networks impacts the stability of the financial system. So for instance, one of the reasons why the 2008 uh, crisis was so severe uh, when it comes to the banking sector was that uh, an initial distresses, so initial perturbations and shocks to the banking system uh, were uh, mediated by the network of banks connected among each other uh, via credit and debt uh, relationships. So there the crucial question is, okay, if you shock one node of the network, how the uh, perturbation will propagate? And it turns out that depending on the structure of the network, of course, you can have very different uh, outcomes. So it, it makes a big difference whether you shock a well-connected node or if you shock a node that is peripheral in the network. But there the challenge is that uh, you actually don't have enough empirical information to uh, reproduce the network in its entirety. So uh, banks, of course, uh, follow some confidentiality practice, uh, so which means that they do not disclose what are the other banks they uh, interact with. And so what is publicly known is only a partial information. So aggregate information like the total amount of money being lent or being borrowed by each bank. And from this list of partial information, partial pieces of information about each bank, the challenge is to reconstruct the most likely configuration of the network so that then you can stress test this, this network. Fascinating and resonates very well with many problems we have when we try to understand how ecosystems work. Um, okay, last question, Diego. Um, what are in your, so you, you, have, you have worked also on uh, food webs and ecological networks, and uh, what are in your view and experience the most challenging aspects of modeling ecological systems with network theory? Uh, well, I think one, uh, I, I, I can think of two, okay, two main applications which partly uh, resemble also the type of applications we have been uh, involved with in the financial setting. So, uh, of course, I can imagine that uh, ecological networks, like many other complex systems, uh, vary a lot in time and space. So there is uh, huge variability, uh, both temporally and spatially. And of course, this is uh, something that, uh, as a physicist, uh, um, well, physics is well prepared to this situation because if you think of the uh, laws of mechanics, uh, in principle, you have this paradox that you learn that uh, the, the individual particles obey deterministic rules. So in principle, this means that to predict the future, you should have perfect knowledge about the present. But on the other hand, we know from thermodynamics that many of the details instead uh, of the uh, degrees of freedom, like velocities and positions of particles are actually irrelevant uh, when it comes to the macroscopic description of the system. So I can imagine that, and, and actually what, what we also learned when looking at other types of networks was that indeed there are several cases in which the knowledge, the detailed knowledge of each individual link, for instance, in a network is subject to uncertainty, uh, be it because it's hard to uh, empirically observe that interaction, or be it because it can be a volatile interaction that it's present at times, but absent later on. And uh, yet you're, you are interested in figuring out whether there are some structural properties 
at the more uh, uh, macroscopic level that are robust and largely independent on these details. So uh, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, Diego, we really look forward to be working together with you in this project. Thank you, Tancredi. I really wish you all the best of luck uh, with this project. I'm looking forward to collaborating on it. Okay, thank you, Diego. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank Okay, so that was it. I, I hope it gave you a good view of a view of the project and different types uh, of things we wish to do. And uh, hopefully more and more people will join us. And uh, of course, we'll keep you uh, informed about all the activities and, um, and events that uh, we will be running um, in the nearest future, I hope. <laughs> I suppose many of those things will be online uh, initially, but uh, yes. Um, hopefully, yeah, you'll, you'll hear more and more from the project. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Tancredi and Matthias and indeed Diego uh, as well for, for, for that. It does sound like a fascinating project and, and one with really kind of general application as well as the kind of specifics that, that I guess you'll be kind of working towards. So I think that's fantastic um, and nice that the door is open for, for other people to join with, with other questions and challenges, uh, networks in different contexts. So that's fantastic. So um, does anyone have, have any specific questions that, that they'd like to ask Tancredi and Matthias? I was wondering, are there any other, other applications that, you, that you've already thought about uh, beyond the kind of ecological and the, and the, and the financial? Are there, are there others that have, uh, that, have, that have come across your, come and come into your thought processes? Uh, yeah, I mean, anytime there's an analogy uh, between an ecological network and another kind of network, be it social network or a landscape network, uh, for example, we have uh, Jackie in, in our project, she's from geography, she's mostly interested in uh, landscape. Uh, and, and, you know, in theory, you know, a food web is pretty different from the kind of networks you have in a landscape. But anytime you have an analogy in terms of the network between a, a thing like a food web or a very different object like a social network or landscape network, anytime this happens, you can transfer the methods. And so you can start thinking about what stability means in general. And for example, the difference between stability in the sense of how the network is configured or stability in the sense of the stability of the individual pieces that make up the network. In ecology would be the stability of the population of each species. But for example, in a social network it would be the stability of the person in the network which is pretty topical nowadays, where we really feel we are in a network and we have very small things in this huge network, which is the internet. And it's extremely relevant. And so what is stability there? Is the ability of the configuration, what is the role of the individual node with respect to the total huge size of the network? So I think that um, it's just the metaphor of the network that lends itself to explore this very broad tools. And this is already there. We're not really inventing that. I mean, network theory is something that very many people are working on, uh, but very often from the point of view of theory. And uh, you know, my, people like Diego are really much in theory and much of the high profile work on network is mostly theoretical. But I suppose in our project, really, we try to, to, to bridge this gap between that theory and different objects like an ecological network or or a landscape, or maybe even more, there would be maybe more as people join us, if they want to join us. It could be gene microbial networks. And so, yes, so maybe I'm really not really answering directly to your question, but more indirectly in the sense that the methodology is so broadly applicable that as long as the metaphor of network holds, there will be applications that can be transfer between different disciplines. Absolutely, yeah. So your imagination is the only limitation, yeah. I guess. Um, any, does anybody else have any, any questions? As can I, Michal Brun here? Please, Michal, yeah. yeah. Uh, two really questions, um, maybe one a simple one and one maybe a, a different one. Um, first of all, I mean, what we've learned sort of in, in brushing with networks in the past is that uh, human interference with complex natural networks or systems anyway, whether they're networks or not, 
tend to have unforeseen consequences and not always good. So are there, the first, my first question, are there any good examples of uh, interference with complex natural networks that have actually uh, benefited? Uh, and the reason I ask this is because I'm sure that complex networks that existed probably for, for millions of years or developed over thousands, certainly hundreds of thousands of years, they possibly also have self repair systems in place to respond to perturbations and to heal themselves. And if we interject, are we, are we doing, uh, um, well, are we changing things or maybe even damaging their own ability to self-repair? That's the first question, probably the easiest one. The other thing that occurred to me is, um, is there an analogy? A network is a discrete entity, the way it's, it's normally represented mathematically. Is there a continuous analogy to that? In other words, can you go, can you, can you actually transfer uh, information from a continuous system to a network? I, I suspect the answer is it just depends on the scale you look at it, whether you're looking at individual particles or, or, um, or, or whether if you zoom out, you actually can treat, like a liquid, for instance, you can treat it then as a continuum or a soil. But is there a theory, mathematical theory, that, that actually allows that transfer to take place? That's the second question. Thank you. The, so those two questions are really uh, great. And in fact, they are at the core of one of the things we want to do. And this is this, this thing I briefly mentioned, which is statistical mechanics of network. And uh, exactly what you said, I think it's actually, this applies to both of your questions. Networks are very often pictured as static objects, like a map. You know, it's like, you know, you have a map of a landscape, but we know the landscape is a dynamic entity and the map is just a point in time, it's a snapshot. But in fact, the real object will be changing completely maybe after a while, and then your map is out of date. And networks are no different from that. And much of the literature we have on network at the moment is in, of that kind. You have a single picture of the network, that's it. And then the, the properties of that particular picture are analyzed. What we want to do with statistical mechanics and other tools is to explore the variability around networks. And the fact that the behavior of the single node, for example, changes so that the single node is not a fixed entity is something that varies over time, which we know already in natural network because population vary all the time. And in fact, the links of, net, of, of nodes change all the time. And even if you keep fixed the nodes, they will change links all the time. So a single picture is not sufficient. You know, you, you can say, okay, these are the dominant links, but even those may change. And if they don't change in terms of which species is connected to each other species, it may change the flux of information from one species to another or from one computer to another and so on. And so some of the methods we're going to explore are in fact, trying to make an inference about this variability. What is the variability that we attach to this, um, to the network structure and, um, and we're going to use statistical mechanics to do that. And of course, I think th those two questions are very complex actually. And even the first one, which was supposed to be the easy one is actually complex. <laughs> but uh, uh, we are, I think we are with you there that, uh, yeah, it's exactly there. One of the things we want to do is exactly that. So we don't look at network as fixed static objects. They actually evolving objects and they evolve in the short term in the sense of the single behavior of links and, and, and nodes, but they also evolve even in the longer term. And that's essential, essential to our under understanding of uh, the functions uh, they perform and how they respond to perturbations. Thank you. Welcome, thanks for your question. Anybody else? If not, I had a question from, from Matthias. I was, I was fascinated by that, that kind of revel revelation to me about, about mycorrhizal networks in terms of the connections between different plants of different species. And I was, I was curious how long that, that has been understood and, and, and known and, and explored. Is that, is that a, a, a relatively recent insight or <clears throat> has that been known for a long time? Um, I would say 20 to 30 years. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, I just recently talked with an artist and um, I said like, oh yeah, that's been known for a long time, like 20, 30 years. And he said like, oh, well, that's new. <laughs> so I guess it depends. <laughs> it depends, <laughs> depends on your, on your attitude. Yeah, it depends yeah, on your like... perspective. But it's, uh, that's not exactly new. What is perhaps more new is how it works. Um, 
and also we don't really understand or we don't fully understand the function of it and the, mm -hmm. the real reality of it and we don't understand really why they're doing it i'm sure the fungi are not doing it to do plants a favor they're doing it because they are minimizing their own risk. So the, these particular fungi that we're talking about are obligate biotrophs, which means that they plant on um, a living plant cell to complete their life cycle. So this is, current wisdom says it's their only source of carbon is the plant. And so if you are like that, then you got to make sure you get that carbon. And one of the easiest ways of doing it is to minimize your risk by simultaneously colonizing everything in your way, basically, mm -hmm. that lets you in. <laughs> <laughs> and that alone creates the network because the curious thing about a fungus, if it's now here and <laughs> a little bit later there, it's also still here. Yeah, <laughs> because the fungus is, itself is the, is the network of tubes. And so that creates by itself this network of connections that we call the common mycelial network. Fantastic. And so each and so the fungus in, in its connection with each plant is both giving and receiving. There's, there's a sort of exchange of, of nutrients and carbon of that interface with, with each plant. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I didn't say that, but the, the, the fungus gets carbon from the host plant and presumably is the only source of carbon. And in return, the fungus in this trade relationship gives the plant nutrients, mostly phosphorus, but also nitrogen. But then there is a um, uh, probably a larger set of additional services that are being uh, rendered by that network that are much more incompletely understood. For example, exchange of information. Yeah, fantastic. That's, fa that, that's fascinating. Could you actually say that the fungus was behaving like a stockbroker? Um, uh, passing on resources from one plant to the other because uh, what happens on the surface or above the surface from what, from what I believe, I, I'm not a, a, a biologist so I don't know, is that there's chemical warfare going on between the plants themselves uh, as they physically appear on the surface for, for, in competition for space and light. So um, to have this stockbroker underneath that's actually sharing resources between them probably unbeknownst to each plant. They don't know they're helping each other, but um, it's fascinating. Yeah, there is even a paper that's recently out that, uh, I mean, there is this, these financial metaphors are being used uh, to describe this interaction, which I think is, is useful up to a point. And there is a recent paper that shows that um, a fungus will basically take phosphorus from one spot in the soil, translocate it to another spot in the soil where it hoards it and it can sell it for a higher price to a plant because it's <laughs> in greater demand there. <laughs> this one interpretation of these data, right? I think there's, there's always other interpretations possible, but it is, um, it is, an, it is an appealing picture <laughs> that it's yeah. exactly like you say, actually. <laughs> Yeah, um, but um, they're, as you said, they're maximizing something, and, and, and do trees do it too with their roots. Uh, there are some trees that actually will pump water during the night when they can't transpire from deeper groundwater up and release it uh, below the surface still, and then trans pull it in back in again during the daytime when they can transpire it. Uh, so, and that helps other plants underneath the trees as well. So, there's a lot of very interesting interactions going on. Yeah, and that hydraulically lifted water by these yeah. trees actually is then passed on to hyphae that are symbiotic with these trees in the surface soils. And that is probably the only way that they can persist. Yeah, yes. Evelyn, I, so I, 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 we've, we've run past our time, but I think there's anyone who wants to leave can leave. Um, and anybody that wants to carry on with this conversation can can stay it's so really please. Away. It's a really quick comment and it's just to say there's an even another layer of complexity in that Olga in our lab is working on the endosymbionts, the bacteria that live within the AM fungi that then interact with the plants. So there's a whole other layer of complexity as well. So I think it's uh, just that's all I just wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, that's an awesome one. Um, and there is more and more of that complexity becoming apparent of all these uh, organisms that live inside of the fungi and give them different properties. And there's even a paper that has just come out where a microvirus basically makes a pathogenic fungus a beneficial endophytic fungus. Uh, 
sort of calling into question the categories that we have attached to these organisms. And um, one of my favorite papers of all time is, um, a, a, is called A Virus in a Fungus in a Plant, where a fu endophytic fungus confers thermotolerance to a plant that it colonizes in its roots, but only does so when it in turn is colonized by a virus. Otherwise, this doesn't work. And yeah, in a way it's fascinating, but I also, <laughs> I wonder how much of this stuff um, might really be going on that we have absolutely no idea about. I think we're just scratching the surface on these interactions. And it's definitely very cool. And it might also influence the way they behave, you know, for example, is a, you know, a microvirus has an interest in, in uh, spreading itself, most likely. <laughs> and the only way it is known to spread is with fusing with other hyphae. So does being infected with a microvirus make you more happy to fuse? Is something that nobody has ever asked. <laughs> and that, of course, has network um, consequences. Um, networks look totally different when they're more interconnected. Um, yeah, and th those are. Th I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure anybody has ever um, brought that up in a network context. That's truly fascinating. I think. Lots of questions. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, really fascinating, and, and so much, so much to explore for the future. So um, we might draw draw a line there under the discussions, and, and thank Tancredi and Matthias again. Really, really fascinating. Uh, presentations and, and discussion. So uh, look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week. <laughs>